Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Rachel Nelson, the Director of Institute of the Arts and Sciences at UC Santa Cruz. And I'm really pleased to be here today with Marianne Weems, Larry Shea, Shannon Jackson, and Noah Wardrop Fruin to talk about the Builders Association's newest production, I Agree to the Terms. So this is an exciting a uh, theater media presentation that's ongoing right now at NYU's Skier Ball. And I hope that everyone will get to see it. it. It is playing again, so you still have time. But I think that first that we'll be happy to introduce Miriam, to introduce the show and of the context for you. So let me introduce Miriam Weems to you. Marian is professor of performance, play, and design at UC Santa Cruz and a theater and opera director. She's founder of the award-winning New York-based theater company, the Builders and Association, an influential ensemble working at the forefront of integrating media with live performance. With the company, Weems has created and directed 17 original large-scale productions, and as her work has toured extensively both domestically and internationally. I could talk for a really long time about all the things that Marian has accomplished and done over her career. She's worked in various creative roles with the Wooster Group, David Byrne, Terrence, Terrence Simon, Susan Sontag, the V Girls, and more. But I will actually call her out now and let her tell you a little bit about what she's been up to. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Um, I just want to give a shout out to the, the show that Rachel is currently hanging at the Ma. Is that right? It's going to be amazing. And so, Rachel, of course. So, um, briefly, so as Rachel said, I'm the artistic director of the Builders Association. We have been making work for 25 years. Um, and in many ways have kind of emblematized the mediatization of performance over those 25 years. Um, I would say that most of our shows revolve around the kind of encroachment and um, the impact of technology on labor and on identity. So we do not do plays. <laughs> we make these large scale projects that sort of revolve around um, real world issues like we did a show based on the call centers of Bangalore before people really knew about them. Um, we did a show about data valence. We've done it. We did a show about the 2008 uh, subprime mortgage crisis. And um, we've done a piece about mechanical expert, which is what we're doing here today. So I just want to quickly say that I think one of the hallmarks of our work is that the dramaturgy and the mediaturgy um, really align the form and the content aligns in our projects. And so, for instance, particularly in this one, which is about working online, living online, we made it online. And we also have a component, uh, a second screen component that very much, again, is like a container for the meaning of the project. So I think that'll become clearer as we go along, um, I'm really thrilled to have my uh, my colleagues here today to speak about various parts of the project and the builders and life in the internet. So um, I am going to ask Lindsay, so I'm gonna briefly introduce, so this is about an eight minute video that is a very rough um, series of excerpts of the show that we're doing now. So it is, uh, yeah, it's being presented by the Skirball Center at NYU, but it is an online performance. So um, you will be seeing what the audience sees. And uh, there are three parts to this to the show, and there are three parts in this little video. The second part, which involves the M Turks, the Amazon M Turks, is the bulk of the show. So that's what we'll be talking about probably mostly at the end of this. So Lindsay, without further ado, please. The Computer Underground Digest, or CUD, from Liz E. Borden. I'd like to open up a conversation about cyber sexism here on the board and in the wider hacking community. Uh, less than 5% of pirates are female. Probably less than 1% are freaks or hackers. This skewed participation imports the male culture and values 
into this new world. 1989. Wait, I don't get it. Not enough female pirates and freaks? Are you saying more women should be involved in illegal activities? Oh Sexism is rampant on the net. The alt.sex stuff, bondage, gifts, what have you, appeal to male fantasies of a type that degrade women. BDSs in general, and especially those catering to adolescents and college students, are frightening in their misogyny. Uh, even on general posts, on any subject, women are referred to with such terms as broads, bitches, cunts. Ooh. There's constant hostility against women as a class. Manifesto 2. The Personal Effects of Telecommunicating by Art Kleiner, 1985. In the beginning, there was uncertainty. Did my message go through? Can they see it? Later, pleasure takes over. The exchange of ideas is exciting and flattering. I posted my query at 10, and by noon, I had seven replies waiting. Projects and possibilities blossom quickly without regard to geographical location. For some people, addiction takes over. Logging on 12 times a day, cutting back offline relationships, running up huge phone bills, staying on all night, even dreaming about the network. Addiction, though, for most, is short-lived. There's nothing inherent in the system to trigger it. You get overwhelmed, you cut back, learning to filter out material. You learn to articulate your emotions to avoid being misunderstood. Race, gender, shyness, disabilities, age, physical attributes all become unimportant. You come to feel as if everyone is always available. Now, uh, Sybil, you said before that uh, M Turk was useful partly because you're a little isolated up there geographically. Oh God, yes, I'm 30 minutes from Jesus. <laughs> Unless I'm going to work at the hospital or mur murder chicken at the Tyson plant, it's going to be a an hundred miles round trip twice a day. Okay, so it really makes anywhere. sense. Yeah. Makes yeah. sense to stay home and work, right? Yeah, especially with gas prices so high, and yeah, uh, it, right. it, well, it would on. just cost too much money. Mm -hmm. uh, so can we uh, get back to the nitty gritty here of this work? Uh, Sybil, can you explain to us what a person's approval rating is and why that is important? The higher your approval rating, the more money you make. The uh, better paying hits or the good requesters always requ require 95% or higher approval rating. Once you go under 90% approval rating, you'll never dig yourself out of that hole. In fact, you'll probably just make it worse because you'll just keep getting rejections. Okay, so it's, it's the requesters who are rating you, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Your your approval ratings all based on how many of your hits get approved or rejected. I see. So, what about rejections, Sybil? They, they, it sounds like they're really drastic. If you get one rejection, you'll have to have two thousand approvals, not just hits, approvals, to overcome that one rejection. Rejections are weighted heavier on the platform than approvals are. Hmm. And Michelle, who are the requesters? Who is putting jobs up on MTurk for you all to do? Just about anyone could be a requester. And they're also like private companies, AI training. Um, but lately it's a lot of universities doing social sciences. Interesting. Okay, so Sybil, what's a good day for you on MTurk money-wise? Oh, over a hundred dollars. That'll get my attention. <laughs> okay, and what about an average day? Noel, what's an average day for you, Turking? I used to be about $30 a day. The last couple of weeks, though, there's one single requester I've been making about $100 a day off of. Wow. A pleasant surprise. 
Okay, thank you for sharing that. Uh, now we also want to tell the audience about um, the fees that Amazon takes as the owner of the market. One of our Turkers will be with you in the room to guide you with the hits. Now they know the system, they know how to do it. So let's get out there and make some money, people. Go. Y'all ready to make some money? Okay. Don't be too worried about your approval rating right now because it's gonna suck. You are gonna get rejected. Once you take two steps into the MTurk world, you are gonna get a rejection. But also keep your approval rating at 80% or above. And if this were real life, you try desperately to keep your approval rating over 99% and anything under 95%, you might as well just leave the site because you ain't gonna make shit. How are you all? Oh, you look fantastic. You all look shiny and incrementally richer. So we're gonna review the workers' results. Let's take a look at a dashboard. All right, since we are in call out culture, let's go to the basement. Let's see who's at the bottom of the list. Oh, a couple Our hard people working turkers. People in the 60s and 50s, that's oh a boy. shame. Okay. But, okay, listen, this is really hard work. The M Turkers really know what they're doing. This is a skill to know how to work in this system. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, let's look at the high earners. We've got, okay. uh, let's see, looks There's like Babs is way up there. Amy almost almost hit up to 100. Uh, we're pleased to announce our highest earner is Gigi Schmidt. Gigi Smith. Okay, David, tell her what she's won. Well, Gigi will be joining us in the future in Act 3. Our first item for sale is this NFT exclusive luxury timepiece by Rolex. When friends see your avatar wearing this, they'll know you've really made it. Remember, you never actually own an NFT Rolex. You just look after it for the next generation of property law. You know, over the last year and a half, a lot of us who work in offices have gone remote. And while I do miss seeing the people I work with, I think remote work is here to stay for a lot of people. So you're going to need better tools to work together. And this is what working in the metaverse is going to be like. <laughs> okay. Um, I think it's time to call on my collaborators. So I am first going to introduce Larry Shea. Um, and I don't know, well, Rachel, are you going to tell yes, us? Yes, let me do it. And okay. you know what? Um, I'm going to say too, so we've already gotten a, a little question. So let me go ahead and ask this question too, just to make sure that people are totally have the project um, contextualized. And this is perfect to have Larry with us now because Larry is a collaborator on this project and um, responsible for a lot of the um, app components of this and we'll hear more about that in a moment but anthony actually already wrote in and said what exactly is the testing being done is it a means of product testing and approval like what exactly is happening in this uh, that the, the these workers are doing and that the game is tracing what are turkers doing yes not in this project in the real world right. in the real world i mean larry feel free to throw in but they are they are training ais that is partly what we got interested in in the first place is that the, the being pay per click is teaching machines to see. Um, and they there are lots of universities posing social science surveys. And so they are getting, you know, IRB um, um, products. And then there are, yeah, there are lots of marketing companies who are trying out products. So Larry Shea, please take over. Yeah, I mean, I, I had to switch to dramatic lighting. The sun's going down here. but. Um, the, the, we did research, like people will post on YouTube and then we had our collaborators and they would tell us what they were doing. Um, and it's kind of anything, it's a platform, right? And so anybody can be a requester and then they create these human intelligence tasks for micro payments. And it could be anything from like entering receipts in. So maybe you run a company that like 
you can people take photographs of the receipts and then you give them, you know, uh, their taxes at the end of the year and maybe they don't scan it very well. So you upload those receipts that are a little blurry and you get like 300 people to like tell you whether that's a six or a nine. And so there's just, it's an endless, like huge depressing source of, of micro tasks for people to do for, for micro payments. And so it could be anything. The more interesting ones are like training AI to like circle logos and parking lot photos of cars to, you know, um, to picking out, you know, um, well, I don't even remember. Um, yeah, I'm, there's, there's just, it's kind of anything you can think of that is like weird that you need a human brain to do. Uh, that we think is digital. There. Yes. So let yeah. me, you know what, when we're totally got off and they, let me first just tell people who you are, right? So, I mean, I've given them the little bit of nugget and thank you so much for giving us that. And I know that we'll keep kind of unpacking this as we go along, but let me just tell everybody first that you're an associate professor at Carnegie Mellon University and an artist and an educator working with a wide variety of digital and analog media, creating visuals and interactivity for theater productions and fine artworks around the world. Larry led the team that created an aug augmented reality app for smart poems used throughout the elements of Oz for the Builders Association, as well as working on this project and other projects with the association. So why don't we let you now tell us a little bit about yourself and your work and um, Marion and I will switch off and we'll join you back in a few minutes. Uh, okay, great, sure. Um... Yeah, I mean, I can talk, I can show Oz really quickly, just because I think it was, you know, it was the uh, first project, I guess, officially that I've done with with the builders. And this is what you would see if you held up your phone. So that was just, we had to actually make an app that had to get approval from the app store. And it was a total nightmare. And I had to work with pe really wonderful animators and creative coder people because it was a lot of big, heavy lifting. And um, and the next image is like the audience. You can see them actually using their iPads and stuff. And I love this photo because it just shows you, you know, people doing things you're not supposed to do in theater. Um, so you would see the live stage action as well as whatever we decided, you know, would make sense for that scene. And it was like, you know, the poppies, uh, you know, Glenda the Good Witch's bubble, fun stuff like that. Um, so that was a really wonderful project. It was, and when we were working on that project, we first started using the words like AR and stuff. And then through rehearsals, we started calling, well, just phone, what's phone up to, you know, you've got sound, you've got lighting, you've got phone. And that was a really fun way to think about it. Um, for this project, uh, you know, we wanted to use phone again. Um, and it made a lot of sense, uh, that, you know, the, instead of making an app, we could just use off the shelf web technology. Google has all these services up there that are very affordable. Um, and I had luckily have a student who went off and got a UX degree after they studied with me. And so, um, you know, this is, uh, I'll share my screen again. Um, is that it? <laughs> Hold on. Nope, not that one. <laughs> That's the control panel. Hold on. There we go. So um, this is what your phone would show uh, for the first part of the of the show. And we just made it basically an interactive website that's designed for the sort of uh, form of the of the phone form factor. And it's interactive. We we worked with these archives of BBS texts. So during that first part where Mo and David are on the stage and they've got the video projection in, behind them and they're they're doing these manifestos, uh, while you're waiting for that to happen, you could scroll through some of these. Um, these old directories like this databases and then we have cues built into the system so then when when they're actually speaking you can hear see what they're uh, speaking which kind of is an accessibility aspect out to it in a fun way and then during the manifestos you just see these title cards so um we kind of use the phone as what i'm calling a second screen um we also did this for a project um at the beginning of the pandemic called the um the Cameron project where we sort of took a, we encouraged people to use like a second monitor or their phone to play sound and video while we had a Zoom sort of based conversation. So this is the third project where we've been kind of expanding into people's rooms using their personal devices, um, which I think is really fun to do. And so then this, we built our own version of the dashboard that the workers at MTurk would use every day. And we did all this research and we rewrote a bunch of hits and made them funny. Um, and so this is what the audience is doing 
when they go into those breakout rooms, when Mo was like, go, right? After that, they go into breakout rooms. They have a host who's one of the Amazon MTurk people that we've been working with. And they explain to them how to do this. And so the audience gets a little taste for what it might be like to do this day in and day out. Although we make it kind of fun and enjoyable. Um, and so, you know, and there's things, you know, opinion surveys, there's things about religion. Um, there's a lot of stuff about consumer behavior and products. So that's sort of the, um, the nature of, 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 of what's on, like what we discovered on the show, uh, you know, on, on um, sorry, on MTurk. And then at the end, we convert it to, um, oh, let's see, that one's not, oh, now it's not loading. Oh, well, too bad. let me try it again. Oh, well, I can show you on my phone. Um, let me stop, stop the screen. So that uh, in the end, there's like a little, I can show you a video of the, here it is. So uh, at the end, we have a little marketplace in Meta. And so when the uh, action goes to Meta, you're seeing on your phone these sort of items that are NFTs that actually are NFTs that we just kind of stole and uh, put on our version of Meta. And so this is the kind of the future that they're building for us. And so the, the phone kind of mimics the trajectory uh, of the dramatic trajectory of the show as well as of the internet in general. So that's, that's what I did for the project. Um, I can, you know, there's so much more to talk about, but I'll stop there. Um, yeah. Thanks, Larry. So what I'm going to do is we, have, we also have Shannon Jackson and Noah Wardrip Fruin with us. So I'm going to have each of them kind of introduce themselves to and their relationship or why they're here. Um, I'll introduce them briefly and then I'll bring you all back together. So we'll see you again in a minute, Larry. And I'm going to ask Shannon Jackson to join. Shannon Jackson is the Cyrus and Michelle Hadithi Professor of Rhetoric and Theater, Dance and Performance Studies at UC Berkeley. She's the author of numerous books, including one about the Builders Association, so which is perfect. And of course, the highly influential social works, performing art, supporting publics from 2011. She's received numerous awards and fellowships, including a 2015 Guggenheim Fellowship. And it's a real pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Rachel. It's wonderful to be here. Thanks to um, Marianne for inviting me, <laughs> as she always uh, often does into collaborations, including this one. Uh, I, I, Rachel gave an introduction that largely explains my connection uh, to this project. Uh, it really comes from a more historical connection, but I'll take it back even farther. Uh, as a, when I was a, uh, a department chair in the theater, dance and performance studies department, uh, one of a few different units with which I'm allied on campus, uh, I had the opportunity to meet Marianne through a mutual friend and we were, and I had the chance to learn more deeply what uh, kind of theater she was up to and what she was making and also that she had an interest in California um, and in being and hanging out with us in California more often and lo and behold after a lot of um, work we ended up being able to host at UC Berkeley a residency that turned out to be the first uh, a workshop um, process, um, a workshop version of what would become Continuous City, a, a wonderful um, production in their, in their oeuvre that ended up touring internationally. And that experience set me up for really thinking more deeply about what it means to join uh, the, uh, the historic uh, uh, infrastructure of a theater to the ever new technologies of new technology and to think um, about how the builders uh, have made use of different technologies in each show at every turn, using the theater as a space to um, meditate and excavate the social impact of those technologies, even as at the same time, those technologies transform in some way the nature of the theatrical experience. And you just saw Larry giving an example of how one of their most recent productions, Elements of Oz, does just that um, uh, via augmented reality and even changing the protocols of theater that usually don't allow you to open up your phone. So uh, with that in mind, I, uh, and as uh, Rachel said, I ended up having the privilege of also authoring a book in collaboration um, with Marianne on the builder's work, starting from their very first production, The Master Builder, through uh, House Divided uh, and multiple productions in between. Uh, and I'm really then interesting now to think about what 
and how I, I agree to the terms continues the pursuit that they've been on in many ways and also goes into some new directions and new variations, but maybe we'll save that for dialogue later. Thanks. Thanks so much, Shannon, for that. And I'm much looking forward to the conversation. So last, let me introduce everybody to Noah Wardrick Fruin, who's a professor of computational media at UC Santa Cruz and co-directs the Expressive Intelligence Studio, a technical and cultural research group. Noah has authored or co-edited six books on games and digital media um, for MIT Press, including his most recent book, How Pac-Man Eats. He's received numerous awards and fellowships, and I could say this for everybody. I always sound like, it. I, again, if another person who's received numerous awards and fellowships, and his collaborative playable media projects have been presented by the Guggenheim Museum, the Whitney Museum, and other prestigious museums and galleries. So thanks, Noah. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, well, I'm mainly here as a fan of the Builders Association work. Um, but maybe it's worth unpacking a little more of what that means. So uh, I look at the work with a variety of different hats on. Uh, one of the hats is that I'm someone who studied the history of and is kind of uh, invested in uh, the history of what we might call new media or digital media or computational media, uh, or maybe just call like the air we breathe now. Um, so like, the only time I've ever been starstruck is when I met Doug Engelbart. I was like, oh my God, you're Doug Engelbart. He's like, yes. But anyway, um, uh, so I think this, you know, this project and the builder's whole body work is fascinating from that perspective. And I'm looking forward to talking about it that way. But I also do work um, specifically on computer games. So that's uh, how, how Pac-Man Eats got its title. And there's something very consciously gamified about these kinds of interfaces that we see on micro work platforms like Mechanical Turk. So I'm looking forward to discussing that. Uh, and then finally, I'm also somebody who's worked in digital literature, both as a creator and as a critic. And I think there's a real relationship between the kind of performance uh, engaging technologies um, that the builders do, and also what I've seen in the digital literature community uh, and try to create in the digital literature community. So I'm hoping there are opportunities to talk about that. Thanks so much. And now I can have everyone join us and we can have a conversation across this platform and try to make it as unstilted as possible, uh, which is always such a, a funny thing to do. but. You know, one of the things that I thought that maybe we should start with I was actually thinking about where your trailer started to, Marion, the um, kind of talking about you know, the problems of gender and, like, you know, all these kind of problems that are both um, within the tech space and also that the tech space are supposed to solve. But of course, that we're also talking about a labor force that are called M Turks, which is a very, to me, a very loaded term around you know, with racial implications and a long history. So perhaps we could begin by unpacking a little bit how that name is attached to this, what exactly is going on with this labor community, and why is Amazon advertising for M Turks? So do you want to answer that or should I take it? Sure, I'll throw in briefly. I mean, Amazon Mechanical Turk mm -hmm. is a platform for um, you know, gig workers to take up these micro tasks, um, as we've described. They took the name unbelievably from this, I think, 19th, early 19th century automaton figure that you know toured the capitals of Europe and was this chess playing Turk, you know, a sort of statue with a turban. At, you know, Orientalism at its finest. And um, it was the toast of the town. Nobody could figure out how the Turk did these, these um, you know, was able to play chess at a sort of above, above average level. But um, it turns out that there was a little person sort of tucked inside uh, the Turk that was actually playing chess. So unbelievably, Amazon, without irony, decided to call this platform platform Mechanical Turk because there are little people inside the machine taking on these micro tasks. So they're this invisible labor that actually is, that are, you know, running this larger system. And um, so 
that, you know, there you have it. <laughs> it requires no commentary. Um, yeah. Okay. And there are people all over the world who are turking um, at various levels. And as you saw uh, from the people that we pulled together on Amazon Turk, I might add, um, these collaborators that really have become collaborators are, you know, across the country, often in rural places where there are no other, no other opportunities for employment um, or in Noel's case, he is quadriplegic. And so this is actually, you know, one of the few jobs he can do from home. Um, so we were able to find people who, you know, are engaged in the platform in ways that are that go beyond a lot of other projects. I mean, there are other art projects that have used Mechanical Turk. Um, and Daniel Dean even did a performance. But I think that they are in many ways kind of harvesting the labor of the workers that they're, that they're um, you know, employing in their projects. Whereas these people really did become collaborators. So, yeah. Well, I think that opens up into a whole lot of things. And I think that like what you just said about collaboration and all of that are things that we should get to. But I think that maybe getting in a little bit more and asking, other, um, the rest of you too, to join in to thinking about the ways in which we this work is grappling with the dynamics and dilemmas of so-called techno-utopianism. I mean, that's the way we've kind of set this up at the beginning in your trailer that I think we thought was so beautifully done. Um, so Noah, do you wanna talk a little bit about that for us? Sure. Um, so I, you know, I lived through that era, right? I was on a BBS through a phone line you know, in on an Epson PC, but it's also something I study. Uh, and certainly uh, for me as a participant in BPS culture, um, you know, the other people were just hidden, right? Um, but you could discover things, right? Like that's where I discovered Eliza. Eliza was live. Most of the people were not, right? They were asynchronous. Um, and I'd say as I got older and eventually studied it, I ran into uh, so many of the things that um, people like Fred Turner and others have written about where there's this kind of um, naive libertarianism, there's you know sexism and racism. There are all these things that, um, you know, now in the era of, you know, Facebook's, uh, echo chamber hate groups um, are maybe no surprise, but at the time really were, right? It, it seemed like, well, if we could give everyone a voice and every way, we had a way to put things out there and everyone a way to respond, um, wouldn't that just be all to the good? Um, wouldn't that tear down so many of the, you know, horrible social constructs we have in the meat world or the atoms world, wouldn't it be better to replace it with the bits world? Um, so yeah, so for me, uh, you know, the, the piece uh, felt a bit like a, a funeral for all of that, right? It's, it's not news that it's dead, but I haven't run into many things that actually, you know, both, uh, honor its memory <laughs> and point out how it was flawed from the beginning. So Larry or Shannon, do you have something you want to add to that? Oh, you're muted. So I would say that um, so much of the builder's work has been um, <laughs> an excavation of those dreams and in, in sometimes perhaps less explicitly, but still, um, um, uh, putting out there those sort of dreams and hopes of whatever new technologies would do, what, how they would liberate, so that the principles that that what weren't shown in the trailer but are in the show from um, John Perry Barlow or from Stuart Brand about how this telecommunications sphere, sphere will give everyone a new voice, um, that we will yield, you know, it will, you know, it will derive better governance than we had before, it will be more fair, all of those hopes. And there's, I think, um, a way that almost really from the beginning, so many of the um, work that the builders have been doing has been using the theatrical frame in order to place the technology sort of as an object of um, 
an object um, for changing the aesthetic of theater, but at the same time, making it an object of critique in some way. Um, and part of, and I would say one of the huge ways that, <laughs> that um, it seems to me that they've often done it is by underscoring, you could say, the material effects of these so-called immaterial um, processes. Uh, uh, and to remind, and you know, as, as Marianne says, that un unironically, that there is a body in the machine, <laughs> uh, or that there are physiological effects um, to the algorithm. And in fact, the algorithm is made by a physiological being. And that that, you could say, uh, really animates I mean, you could even see it in one of their very first productions, the, um, on, the, on the Master Builder, which um, has been was was as a first production exposing labor from the get go, showing how the theatrical um, apparatus is dependent upon carpenters and electricians, um, uh, and making that labor sort of part of the aesthetic, all the way through to Aladdin, to which um, um, Marianne referred, which seems like a really great great production that I encourage anyone who's tuning in or looking at this um, recording to, to look at that show and look at um, the compare and contrast the what it is to excavate the call center operation, to do interviews and participant observation with call center operators, um, to think about their labor and the dependence of global economy on the labor of people in Bangalore and Hyderabad. Um, next to now this one, which is different, um, a different kind of labor, the hit, this, the hit is different from the in human intelligence task of the call center operator, and also differently presented because in that show, recorded interviews were played inside of the theater. And in this case, actual workers are um, working with you in a game-like environment. And so that shift seems to me where there's continuity and change um, in terms of their ever-changing aesthetic. Um, that's great. I was going to say some of those same things in different ways. I mean, I, I think that what's so fun about working this way is that the materiality of the technology forces um, you to, to 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 really confront it. And so, you know, to to you, you're using the like the difference in between the, the Bangalore project, which I didn't work on, and this is that now interactivity is, is is possible. Like everyone has a phone that is you know incredibly powerful and there's all this backend sort of web technology where we can do a website really quickly and people can click buttons and we can know what they said and, and we can have them interact in real time with each other. So, and then you bringing that into the theater experience was, is really, you know, exciting. And it also prevents our critique from being hermetic. I mean, the, the, the people that are making money on this, you know, uh, site have opinions and we can't ignore them and their opinions are valid, very, you know, more valid than ours maybe. And so, so then we're, you know, we're, we're confronted with that reality. And then also the tools are somewhat liberatory. Like we used the tools in the way that you're, you know, we're taking these consumer products and opening them up and using them for our own ends. And that's a utopian gesture. So nothing's foreclosed. I think that that's the other exciting thing about working this way is that you kind of, um, you kind of get your hands dirty in multiple ways. And I hope the audience sees that and that is exciting. I have to say it's um, that's beautiful. It's like you're both taking away the utopic dream and yet at the same time using the technology in ways that still gesture to possibilities is a is a really nice and beautiful move. I think that's um, exactly what, how I think of your work, right? How can it be both critique and something else? not just critique or whatever that would be. So I think that, um, again, there's so many different places we could go to this, but I think that returning and talking a little bit more about what you said, the kind of deep collaboration that you ha have made with the people who participate in this, right? These people that um, are the, the faceless, uh, the faceless or the unbodied, right, within the technological systems. I think that it's such an interesting thing. And I think that one of the reasons why I know that Noah, we were drawn to this very much, you know, from people kind of more on the outside of this, but looking in, is the way that you place people at the center of something that is in fact imagined as people less. Right. And I, mean, I was thinking when you was watching the people try to match, like, you know, are, is this the same or this is different? I mean, I must do those like three times a day where I have to pick all the bridges or the stop signs of something. And you just assume that when you're doing that, that 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 is a dehumanized system. Right. That I'm being 
put into a system without people. But what you've just shown us suggests that in fact, that they know what is in those images because people have told them that there's not a system that knows them, right? That they're this game that's been taught. So I think that maybe we should talk more about the importance of seeing the people in this and the collaboration. So who wants to start here? Should I call on somebody? <laughs> I can jump in briefly. Um, <laughs> another part of this show, the reason that this started was, Rachel, because of our intense irritation with those CAPTCHA things that require you to get into anything. Um, and just to, as a footnote, you are being, your labor is being harvested. You're not, you're doing what MTurks do for a penny. You're doing it for free. So um, that is part of what is what we're sort of talking about is, yeah, how we're all engaged in these different forms of, um, you know, yeah, I guess mediatization and, and technology and live people, live bodies. So I wanted to just um, say yet again, how indebted I am to Shannon for her incredible ability to, I think, bridge the all of these worlds with performance because um, it's still, an ongoing issue, or rather, there's sort of this question about how this is performance. Um, you know, and I always used to say, well, it's in a theater, and that's why it's theater. But now it's not even in a theater. And so um, there we are sort of riding this line between, you know, documentary and um, critical engagement and actual performance. Um, and it, it's been amazing getting the Turkers involved. One of the things that we put in the original um, ad that we placed on Amazon was people who were interested in theater. And so Sybil, the woman from Arab, Alabama, was in her drama club in high school. And that was like the whole beginning of how we were working together. She was like, you know, doing her old monologues and we had this whole relationship that was built up around this very antiquated idea of theater. Um, but it's amazing how seamless it's been to invite them into this space and treat them as performers, um, but have them really be occupy sort of both that position and then also their position as workers um, equally. If we pick up on Shannon's point to point out the fact that when they're working in the, the performance field, they're still workers, right? That it's, their, it's, it's labor as well. So pointing out these parallels. Shannon, do you wanna add to that some too? Um, yeah, I think maybe a few things because I think we're on a couple of different topics. And one, just to say uh, that maybe needs to be aired that pre-COVID, um, I, I would have said or often would say that the special thing about the builders is bringing all of these screens, um, potentially streaming, potentially AR, potential, into this um, old traditional industrial space of the theater um, and pre-industrial space of the theater. And, and that, it, that that juxtaposition produced a certain kind of tension. And when Marianne talks about a relationship between theme and form, or Larry has said it as well, that that that, um, that that the hybrid nature of the medium of being so materially there in theater and at the same time dispersed and screened um, um, with all of the new technology produced like uh, conditions for critique, for, for some a kind of jostle of the critical imagination, and also for um, if your aspiration is actually to think about the social effects of technology, um, this embodied medium becomes that becomes the perf perfect place to stage that conversation. But now I think there really is a question about about how we receive this particular show um, uh, during the pandemic when so much theater became screen based work. Um, when so much theater became something that people received as we're receiving each other now on a screen at home. And, and at the same time that this project that the builders have conceived is being hosted in a theatrical season at the Skirball. Um, and, and, so that, and so there is for me truly a question about what, what, it, what's, what it still means that it's coming from a theater genealogy. Um, and now placed 
um, you know, but now making use, but not making use of a theatrical stage anymore. Um, I have more things to protect. Maybe we can talk later about the specificity of Turk labor, but that's just one question I'd have now based on a couple of things Marianne said. So Larry, do you want to, um, which part of this do you want to jump into? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, I mean, there's so much. Um, I think Shannon's last question is really fascinating because, uh, you know, I teach in a, in a pretty straight up theater program and, um, you know, there's often, you're often having wide ranging conversations between like why and or what or make trying to make things legible to people that have different attitudes about sort of what performance is or should be. And, um, you know, I, I kind of have a, like a woohoo attitude and but I do I think that, you know, why, why can't we embrace I mean, there, how many screens do you have right around you right now? I mean, you know, like there are screens everywhere. If you're in an urban environment, you're constantly surrounded by technology. You're you're getting messages everywhere. Soon, you're gonna your glasses, even though they're awful, are gonna have that in it. So, you know, it's just calling out for people to take to take um, agency over those things and not let them just be dictated by you know interests that you know maybe aren't artistic, creative, or or that in the end that interesting. And so, I think that it's just sort of it is a question about you know how, what does it mean you know, does it fit under the rubric of theater or performance? But I think, I think human beings are so inquisitive and, you know, I think it, it doesn't, maybe doesn't matter. I don't know. I, I think that, um, sometimes, sometimes I yeah. think almost as if so many theaters had to catch up with the builder's aesthetic perhaps in the last two years, that's sort of like a, a, a maybe a question. I mean, that, that, that some of the resistance of, oh, but you know, we're, we don't do this, we, you know, we can't, we have a certain way of doing tech and all of, and it's not that way. And um, so many theaters and, you know, university theaters are had to, had to adapt and learn a lot of the skills. It seems to me that the builders had been teaching themselves for a while. This is a different topic, but it, it just is just sort of is, I think a big question, I think about the relevance of the builders in a pandemic aesthetic context. That's yeah, and I think that we're all eager to get out of this. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you know, back into the world. But I think that, I think that, yeah, hopefully there's something interesting will come out of it. I mean, part of it is that the story doesn't stop. You know, it doesn't start at, you know, curtain and it doesn't end at, you know, or, you know, it doesn't start when the curtain goes up and doesn't end when the curtain goes down. I think that's something that marketing has understood forever, right? Mm -hmm. And that, that, you know, you're creating relationships with people. And so, you know, I think that we actually have a lot to learn from these systems that do not fit under an arts rubric. I think they've done a lot of behavioral work. They've done a lot of sort of, you know, psychological work and research and spent a lot of money getting us addicted to their games, which, you know, and, and they know how to control us. And so why are we letting that, you know, why are we letting that happen without grabbing it, you know, is, is sort of my attitude. Mm -hmm. Very much so. You know, the, the irony of it all is that we started this project before the pandemic. I mean, I thought four years ago when I met Sybil, like we could do this project and she's already online and she's far away. And isn't it amazing that we have this container, um, but nobody would ever do a show on Zoom. That's really what I was thinking. Um, so, so then it was quite, it was seamless when we slid into making it. Because we were already like, this is the medium. This is the medium of the show. So there wasn't, oh my God, we have to do the cherry orchard on Zoom. You know, it was like the, the form was already there. Um, yeah, that's all I wanted to say. <laughs> so interesting. So no, had, you look like, sorry, go ahead, Rachel. Oh, I was going to have something because all of the things that you're saying that everybody is kind of saying and about this, like the changing technology, you know, changing the technology from the theater, which, you know, was a technology, right? And had all this stuff to the technology of the internet and all the ways that you've adapted media around these forms. And it, now you're taking on games at the same time that labor also is taking on the form of games. I mean, that's what we've just seen, right? And I actually thought, I know that Noah, as they are games person or whatever, might want to th think a little bit about this point here and be able to expand on that part of it. Yeah, I think there's been an interesting tension between um, game and work in a lot of these contexts, right? So 
for those who remember 15 or 20 years ago, the hotness in getting images labeled was not paying Turkers to do it, right? It was getting people to do it for free by telling them it was a game, right? So like Louis Von On's The ESP Game, where people would log in, get matched with an anonymous partner, and as soon as they each typed in one, one description of the image, that they had in common, they got to move to the next one. And you had to try to finish, it was just like Turking, right? You had to try to finish 15 in your allotted time, right? And so they gathered a lot of data and you know, Google spent a bunch of money to license it and so on. And then about 10 years ago, they shut it down, right? Why'd they shut it down? Because now it seems more efficient to pay people almost nothing than it is to try to design a game to get them to want to do it intrinsically. Um, and I think we're seeing similar sorts of things cycling over and over, right? The current hotness of, oh gosh, why am I using that term? But anyway, <laughs> uh, the current mania maybe um, for NFTs and cryptocurrencies and so on um, has birthed in the games community, especially the corporate games community, this idea not just that you'll sell people these NFTs, but also that you will get them to play games that are called um, play to earn games, right? And once again, what we'll try to do is um, primarily get you to do things through saying it's a game, but here we're gonna add in a little bit of paying you something in one of these imaginary currencies, um, because maybe that will combine, you know, the best of the ESP game and the best of Mechanical Turk. It's, it's both fascinating and depressing to watch. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a certain disrespect for the individual human that comes from the scale that we're dealing with that I think is something that we haven't processed right and I think that the scale but for me it's this the thing that I is confusing is the scale that we're at it's like hundreds of thousands of people not you know tens of you know it's lots and lots of people millions of people are doing these things and so it changes our relationship to subjectivity it changes everything and I think that that um we don't know we don't have the forms to discuss these things at all and 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 i think that um the power is differential is massive so yeah you know I, that's cheerful i i also think just that there's a the gamification of labor is part of what's happening now so there we were in 1.0 you know, nobody's going to work. Then 2.0, these people are going to work and they're going to work a lot for very little money. And 3.0, despite these myths around decentralization, you know, meta is everybody get in there and work and we're going to monetize every pixel of this space, right? But then you're supposed to go to work in meta. So that to me is like really using the seduction of this new technology in this really base you know, this kind of masking that seems like so obvious, but it is sort of di dipping into that gaming culture. Does that make sense? Yeah, and it's not, um, it seems almost studiously not taking advantage of anything that the games community has learned about such spaces, right? So, you know, you go into meta, you have to choose some horrible, boring avatar right? Why did people like spending time in Second Life or more recently Roblox? Because they could be fantastical, right? They don't want to be generic worker, male or female person. Uh, and similarly, like uh, Catherine Isbister has been doing research on how to use things like virtual reality to have conversations with people, which she, and she's previously done things like how to use, um, how to use technology in live action role playing conversations, right, and things like that. And um, you can augment a conversation in all sorts of hilarious, amusing, uh, and even pointed ways, like showing who's dominating the conversation real time. But none of that is in the promise of meta, right? The promise of meta is um, we're going to strip out everything that makes this place engaging and interesting. And it's just going to be as impoverished a version of your office as it can possibly be. Apologies for the rant. 
No, no, I'm, I'm right behind you. I mean, I, I don't know if you've experienced this or if our viewers have, but the main thing about meta, the, to me, the, the um, main metaphor is you put on your headset, you map out your desk in the office space, and then you get to put your keyboard in virtual, in VR, in the office, and you watch your VR hands doing work on your VR keyboard. And that is supposed to be, you know, that elevates labor to the point where you're just going to be happy to sit at your desk, your virtual desk and your physical desk. You know, the, the, I don't even, I'm speechless. It, I'm just something Shannon. So I don't know. I don't know because I did, yeah, just didn't know this direction, but thinking about that comment about this is this is actually if this is gamified, it's actually a bad game. Um so uh yeah, it, it's it I mean it's making me also just realize that we shouldn't use, I mean, I mean, Noah more than anybody here would know to say that we shouldn't use that term willy-nilly as if it stands for one thing. I mean, to some degree, I'm assuming you know, experts would think of it as um, that it's a, it's a, it's a way of describing a ubiquitous type of interaction that can actually be very uninteresting. Um, you could say the, um, you know, I am not a robot um, squares are, is a dumb game, you know, and it's part of sort of naturalized habits of being in the world as opposed to a cool game. <laughs> Um, uh, you know, an interesting game, but but it but it it really seems like you know there might be a different that on the one hand, Marianne, you were talking about gaming culture, and there's that, but it's this seems also to be more thinking about um, gaming or you know sort of superficial gaming or um, um, you know banal interaction, banal participation being uh, being being sort of ubiquitous social behavior now <laughs> um not a culture but but sort of everywhere except for what happens though because of course gaming culture is notoriously toxic right and i mean it's notoriously toxic so what is the culture that's being normalized when it moves from being within the world of gaming culture with all of the kind of racism and gender problems of gaming culture into something now. I mean, I just keep the, the MTurk label sticks me every time, like every time it comes out of a mouth, right? I just, part of my brain, like just like sh stops, you know? I'm like, because there's something that's being normalized here. Mm -hmm. And there's a way in which Orientalism and racism and all of these ideas are being used once again to make us succumb to a system of inequality and you know labor that is you know really overarching. So, what role do games play in this? Is I think my question. If people don't mind me stepping into the breach, um, so I, I guess I, I think of two things um, based on what you said. So, one is um, gamification is a very interesting word. Um, I think for most people who play and study games. It means um, here is something that all the play has been emptied out of, right? So mm -hmm. meta is second life without play, right? Um, so many gamified things are basically um, taking ideas of like points and leaderboards and assuming that's what a game means. You can sort of put it over anything. Um, when actually points and leaderboards are, are decorations on the intrinsically engaging experience of playing with other people, right? Um, so uh, that's that's one interesting thing about the term gamification is I think it um, it, it is used very accurately okay. um, to, to, to describe this sort of shell of gameness um, over something that's absent of play. Right. Uh, and then, yeah, about gaming culture, um, I think one interesting thing about this piece, right, that brings us all here together today is how it shows that those aspects are not new or specific of games or specific to games, right? You know, I, I lived through an era when I thought the whole Earth electronic link was the coolest possible thing, but it was also a place that was full of 
racism, sexism, um, assumptions about, you know, uh, good socioeconomic outcomes coming because you're a good person. And no matter how we disrupted the world, and even if we got rid of, you know, the, uh, the support systems that people like the labor movement have fought for for so long, they would all be fine because what we really needed was our electronic freedom. Um, so anyway, all that by way of saying, uh, gamer culture, toxic gamer culture should not be let off the hook, but I think it has something to do uh, with an ethos that comes from disembodied online interactions, not something that's specific to playing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's so interesting. Thank you for so much of that. What great context and elaboration, Noah. The uh, thinking about um, uh, about how what you've described, you know, relates to you know, sort of basic issues when it comes to say diversity and equity inclusion. What it means to um, 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 it, it, you could say one of the things that um, coming to terms with racist histories like the orientalist ones that produce the Turk um, or the toxic masculinity that was that is um, narrated at the beginning of the show um, you know that to some degree they that that happens in part countering it requires the situatedness understanding the situatedness of of the people engaging the the histories the context um, the labor conditions, the uh, and that so much of what um, what it means to um, engage politically and socially on, the, on those issues is actually filling in context that um, that has largely been invisible. And I think that the decontextualization <laughs> of these behaviors and systems is uh, and again as you're saying was supposed to be where the liberation happened and it's and and when you know the quotations that are attributed to mark zuckerberg in the show or that we've heard him say in other places you could say that the appeal of the meta of the metaverse is also a radical decontextualization where race and ability no longer matter and age no longer matter. Um, but it's of course, precisely by pretending that those could no longer matter and that we don't actually have to deal with them um, that, that it does its most insidious political work. That, that yeah, the that was something I was trying to get into is that this, the idea of contextualization is a wonderful way to frame it because one of the joys of making the piece was finding those moments where it's like, there's like a word problem, like, you know, Jill makes more than Jeff, Jeff makes more than Mary, and you just play with the genders and the names and whatever, and then it means so much more, right? And so to put that into the question so that the audience is like, as they're quickly trying to perform, because they get hooked by the game. And that's the, the thing about gamification that we used is that, that I think the key is that rather than the culture of games, which is definitely different, gamification, uh, my understanding of it is simply that it's just um, behavior modification. It's just like they've gotten so good at hooking us and we will do it. And so one of the things we demonstrate in the show is that you want to be the top earner. You want to be at 100 percent. You want to make the most money, even in this situation where you're, you know, so we're all subject to it. It's, it's, it's all right there. And then within it, yeah, are all these like awful nuggets of history that just slip right in without, you know, the filter. So yeah, it's, it, it was fun to do and also awful to do, yeah. So we do have some questions. I've been tried to work them in. I have to say that the, the first question, Catherine wanted to talk about the relationship with VR, gaming, TikTok and gender and race. I kind of reworked that question for my last question as we do, but, um, and also wants to know if you've researched this out, uh, in context outside the United States. So I'm gonna put that one out there, but then I'm gonna also ask Aaron's question at the same time, which is um, Aaron says he's struggling to word this, but thinking through the different collaborations you've brought up and wants to know in what ways do the laborers, the Turks get compensated for participating in this project and as there's an overlap of labor by them participating in this project with the work they do, in what ways does their, does their participation play both the role of a critique and then what else? You know, she, he's really, he says he's really trying to grapple and understand the role of the MTurks within this project and how they're seeing it within their own fields of labor. 
Um, I think that is a great question. And I'm very interested in what Jennifer is saying about Taylorism too. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna try to take a broad sweep. And I mean, part of what in has interested me long-term are these invisible labor forces, right? That are contributing to so many parts of our lives, of my life, um, but that it is essentially the people who are doing it are being paid to be invisible. They remain invisible, right? And so part of the job is to do the job and cover your tracks and not be seen. So when we did this project, Aladdin, so many, in 2000, um, that involved the, the workers in Bangalore, it was before people in the States knew that there was this vast labor force that was being trained to pass as American and that they were, you know, watching American television shows to, to be trained. And then they were staying up at night to serve Americans during the day. And, you know, when we launched the show, people thought we had either made the whole thing up, like it was science fiction or, um, you know, there were a lot of people said, people said, where did you get all those South Asian actors? Or, and people finally started saying, oh yeah, I heard that voice on the other end of the phone. Now I know, dot, 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 you know, so I don't, so that was a very liberating and interesting experience in terms of just being able to use, you know, theater to shine a light on something. I think that the Turking platform is more, well known, um, and you know because everything's visible now. It wasn't. It's not as um, it wasn't hidden. Although there, these specific people are certainly hidden, and a lot of their work again is about covering their tracks. So, um, a, you know, a vast part of this was really to make sure that Sybil and Ada and Michelle and Noel felt seen. Right, so I was really trying to engage them after a certain point as specific collaborators and not just as like the vast invisible Turker community. Um, that said, we're definitely paying them. We're paying them much, much more than they make doing a hit. And, um, you know, they've all said, oh, I'm happy to do this and you don't have to pay me, but it's like, obviously we're, we're not gonna not pay you. And I think that, um, you know, they are occupying both of those positions. This is still a job for them. Um, perhaps a more interesting job because they're able to talk about their labor rather than be, you know, erased. But that's my, yeah. Does that answer any of that, Jennifer? Yes. Okay. Oh, good. And with the Jennifer's question was the, um, just to give the other people in this that can't see them because only we can see the questions. So Jennifer asked about the kind of different model of labor practices um, uh, that is brought up by this, particularly in relation to the efforts to the Taylorism and the historical efforts to find efficiency in factory line production. So, you know, how is this kind of continuing that history and where is it departing from it? And she also asked, and we didn't get to, is what would unionization look like if seen in a creative art practice? How would we imagine unionization to work within this? That's a good hard one. Well, I mean, we, Lily we and brought Ronnie, it up and they weren't, yeah, they weren't interested okay. in it, right? Oh yeah, no, we, well, let me just preface it by saying that Lily Irani, who's a professor at UCSD, did create a, uh, a, a um, tool for Turkers called Turk Opticon, where they can um, rate requesters. So essentially it is this kind of clearinghouse for information about requesters. Um, but throughout the creation of that project, a lot of Turkers were not happy about it. And they felt like they were being essentially talked down to, I guess I would say. And in the process of making this, we've definitely tried to, uh, many times to talk about unionization, especially because Amazon is finally being sort of called to the carpet. And yeah, as Larry just said, not interested. These people are not interested in unionizing. Um, because it's, you know, perceived as taking jobs away. As we all know here in California, I mean, that's, you know, that was the whole Uber thing. So I think um, it's, so in any case, 
we thought we were going one place and then it turned out to be increasingly complicated. We ended up going another. And I do think it's a, it, it is a, a potentially utopian aspect of all of this. It's like in those BBS texts, it's like, I can talk to anyone in the world. I could, you know, and, it, and it's this potential, right? And then somehow we, we're, we're all, talk, you know, we're all in our news bubbles and we only talk to people of our same socioeconomic class, right? And so it was wonderful to, to, to work with them and to just sort of be continually reminded of my privilege and my, my, my position as like someone who, whose opinions carry only so much water. And I think that, you know, I think it's really, that is in itself a utopian aspect of this project is like, why aren't we talking to people that aren't like us? And, and how can we set up systems to do that? Or maybe we just need to make theater again and just have bigger audiences. I don't know. Um, I think it's still, you know, just has to be said that, uh, so there have been attempts, as Marianne said, um, to do, it, there have been unionizing attempts for the Turks, and there also have been these other things that are at least something like collectivization. Yeah. And um, and it hasn't, um, you know, the, that the people with whom you're working, you know, didn't didn't respond. At at the same time, uh, it just has to be said that that the that the the dispersal of the labor force and the fact that that um, that that um co-workers are not in the factory together <laughs> um that you know creates you know conditions for you know this um this sort of dispersal and hyper hyper individuation of the worker that is not the grounds into which you know something like a collectivized consciousness that's not a collectivized consciousness can easily emerge there despite the so-called connections of of new of social media and um, and I mean that there's, you know, so I think it, it just should be said that that's um, not an accident <laughs> um, in, you know, it is late capitalism. It is, you know, the, the turn from the, you know, from the industrial to the post-industrial model. This is, this is, you know, one of its signature characters. And at the same time, also that um, this question of what does the worker want you know that's that's the history of all labor movements um has been you know sort of those issues and the difficulty of you know even some you know visionary left leader um you know not necessarily getting buy-in at every part of the way that things work obviously is through ideological interpolation <laughs> uh, so so i mean these tensions are part of the um the history of all labor movements and all and and i would say that the history of this form of labor this ever form of changing form of labor is not over yet um and there's and of course there's been and there was during the pandemic a really interesting kind of collectivized moment that happened for at least the essential workers who were doing um you know contagious delivery that 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 expedited you could say something that felt um where you know there was a shift in consciousness um, for certain workers who were doing certain kinds of labor, um, but I think about Arlie Hochschild, you know, way back, you know, doing ethnographies with um, with uh, flight attendants who were called stewardesses, you know, and who and who were proud to make the make their um, airline. Uh, make the airline cabin feel like their living room, uh, and and that they and that was part of feeling pride in your work, and um, you know, and other things were happening at the same time. And again, again, I guess I would say this: this is the history of all labor movements, and this one is not over. That was great. It also made me think that um, that the way that we're talking about this and actually in this COVID moment where we ourselves are in this thing. Well, there's two things I thought. I mean, one thing is, is that of course, there, how do you unionize when you're invisible to each other, right? That this isn't just about making people invisible within the system, but actually doing exactly what you said, this individualizing. And then how much is now the like larger and larger parts of the workforce being put into the same, just even as more and more um, companies are under pressure to unionize, everyone's working from home and becoming more and more invisible to each other. Mm -hmm. So Catherine um, has asked another question to, to really wanting us to think more about wanting all of you to think more about disembodiment in this forms and thinking about the ways in which 
there um, or can be, are we thinking about there's anything beyond avatars that might in the future or sooner re-embody these forms, which I actually think is very much what you're doing with the Builders Association. But uh, so, but Catherine's thing wants to know what else we're thinking about. Are you thinking about VR or other immersive works that are screens plus bodies and how this connects to labor issues as well? Noah, do you have a thought? <laughs> well, I was just thinking back on my own work. I've never particularly been interested in doing work for head-mounted virtual reality. Um, I feel it's like a, a blindfold with a couple of televisions inside. Um, but I have done quite a bit of work in the cave, right, which is a, a room-sized virtual reality display where you can inhabit it with other people. And so you can actually see your own body, you can see their bodies, you can use your proximity to them, you can use your proximity to the physical walls to move around. Um, and to me, that's just much more compelling. Of course, it also seems like some sort of, you know, nightmare out of Fahrenheit 451 or something. Um, so, um, but yeah, I guess I'd say I'd be, I'd be much more excited to have a cave in my house than to have a, uh, a, a, a set of blindfolds for the whole family. And, um, I guess, yeah, yeah that, that must be in part my attachment to embodiment. Hilarious. I mean, I do want to also just raise the, the, um, this idea around techno liberalism, right? I'm sorry, that, you know, through technologies, um, we're going to be freed from all of these, uh, from racism. Right from gender uh, inequality, but you know, so that's the the Stuart Brand whole Earth moment was like we're all going to pull away from labor, right? But what obviously what we're finding, and as I was saying before, the labor is there erasing itself while it's still being done by humans. So this human free future, you know, does not equal anti racism. Like the technology sort of innovates on these embedded ideas about racialized and gendered labor. So, you know what I mean? So even though, so we're, we're in this constant pull between like the, dis, the fantasy of disembodiment and then the fantasy of like us all being freed from this, from gendered and racialized bodies. Yeah, and I guess what, I mean, the, I still, keep wanting to ask myself and others what it means that this show is inside of a theater season to the question of you know what it means to not be that it that, and to say that it's still not a film it's still not an online game it's still theater why why um and that i suppose relates to the question of of where where bodies are but also i suppose um at the very least i I, I had the sense of the situatedness of the work of the of the workers who were your collaborators, I would say. Um, and not only, you know, that they had personalities and names, but they had singing careers and um, took phones on buses to work and were a, a quadriplegic which is a you know this incredibly unique form of embodiment and this sort of social politics of each of those positions i feel like i felt um uh you know um a, a bit more a bit a bit as opposed to just not even thinking that there was a human there at all you know behind the algorithms that are um you know in my orbit and uh, so, so you know that's partly I think the um, strength of find of being collaborative and finding people um, being um, you know resourceful in terms of making sure that you're showing a range of experiences. There's not just one Turk worker. Um, yeah, these just a few thoughts there to that question, but. Um, 
certainly I felt the, alg uh, the algorithmic, life, algorithmic life felt more embodied after this show. Yeah, I th I th that's great. I mean, I think that there is a way that these algorithms are people's choices, right? So, you know, it, it's, there's, that's what I mean. We don't have the language to understand the scale that we're dealing with and, and, and how to humanize that scale or, or how to, to wrap our heads around living in a world where we're interacting at all these levels with each other. And, you know, code is labor. It's human labor. It's not some, you know, soon AI will probably write a lot of code, but like, all these software programs are just, you know, hundreds of thousands of hours of people working and making money to put their kids through college and stuff. So it's like, it's, it's all human, you know, it's not abstracted and it, it's abstracted in our understanding, but it's actually very concrete. And, and that's sort of a, a confusion that I, I have. And I think there's this idea that we're kind of becoming post algorithmic, maybe that, you know, everything's data driven and you train this giant language model on all this data and then it's actually intelligent in a way those old human authored algorithms weren't. Um, and I think we're slowly starting to come to a realization that first, you know, yes, people write the algorithms. Second, people spend a huge amount of time collecting and cleaning up data. And then third, that what we're doing is we're laundering all the biases or, you know, we could use a stronger term, but let's use biases. We're laundering all the biases in the data um, now through the, through the machine, right? The machine said, these were the resumes of the people to interview the machine says, you know, it, it, I, I can stop, but it's, it's interesting to see how we went through that utopian moment very briefly with this, um, this turn toward data. I mean, I think that, and I, you know, we're pretty much almost out of time. I mean, I would think that Mary and Larry, I mean, one of the things that, I mean, I think that Shannon just really put it in really good context too, that what Noah's saying this, like, you know, this, I mean, this dystopia, right, that's happening, this very dystopic thing. And that this, the work of performance, the work of the theater, the work of the space of art, right? And aesthetics as a place to rehumanize this, that this is a space that you're using the technology of the theater, even if the theater itself, the architecture, has disappeared because that's a place where we understand bodies to be and we understand people to be and we understand connections to be made in order to fight back against this dystopic environment. I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful project. I have to say that I've been talking to Shannon, about, to Miriam about this project for seemingly like three years. And yeah, that got completely disrupted by COVID and I'm amazed that you managed to do it. So does anyone else have last thoughts? But I just want to thank you all. It has been so fruitful and um, amazing to hear everything. I think this could go on. I think this could be a book. Oh, Shannon, yes. <laughs> Shannon, get on it. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you to the um, staff at both at Skirball and at UC Santa Cruz um, for hosting us. Thank you all so much for being here. This was a true pleasure. So we will see each other again in okay. real world and on Zoom. Thanks, so <laughs> thank you all for joining us and yeah, more soon. Check out, I put the links in so that you can find the Skirball Performance, so you can find the Builders Association and uh, everybody check it out. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.